The second person we're going to look at in this first lecture is Adolf Augustus Berle Jr. Adolf Berle was a liberal at a time when the term liberal was slightly less abusive than it is used today, but was still considered to be a, not to be a, a pleasant way of describing anyone. The idea was that he was someone who represented a, a view that was un-American, perhaps, sort of stood a little bit outside the norm. Yet he was actually a, a, an American diplomat, etc. So what was it that he was talking about? So he was a university professor, he was an author, he was a US diplomat, he was part of an establishment, part of a liberal establishment at the time. And he was a professor of corporate law at Cumbria. He was there until 1964, so he's actually, he belongs to the generation prior to Chandler. He was just coming to the end of his career when Chandler was starting out on his career and doing that. But he was just started looking at the state of the, the, the US in the 20s and the 30s. You can imagine this is a time of, of, of major appeals, major economic problems that were going on. He was an active politician. He worked with uh, the FDR, Frederick Delaney Roosevelt administration, on what they called the New Deal and the Good Neighbour Policy. This was an attempt to boost the economy by classic Keynesian spending. Keynes, contrary to popular belief, was not anti-capitalist. Keynes was actually pro-capitalist, but he believed that capitalism needed to be saved from itself. And to a certain extent, he believed capitalism needed to be saved from capitalists. And to a certain extent, Bill was the same. They were both liberals, both in their... Uh, beliefs and in their political ideas, but also in their lifestyles. He was sort of a Renaissance man, Bird. He wrote uh, and quite a number of things. He wrote, talked about the impact of cooperation of classical economic theory. He talked about modern cooperation of private property, 20th century capitalist revolution. He talked about the idea of could you have power about property. He was also a Latin American diplomat. You remember this is a time of major American intervention in Latin, the United States intervention in Latin America, where they believed was their backyard and they sort of overthrowing of governments, etc. So some ways he may have been a liberal at home, but some people have said that he was a, a, a long way from that away from home. So he was a, the classic uh, Renaissance man in there's a lot of pies involved in diplomacy, involved in education. Okay. But what brought him to the fore, what brought him to the fore was well, the collapse of the stock market in 1929 leads to the Great Depression. This was the greatest stock market collapse in modern history at the time uh, and certainly as arguably probably has argued whether or not the most recent was at the level i don't believe it was and it led to mass poverty well there's a time when there was across the world there was very little in the way of social welfare so if you lost your job and there was no other jobs around the idea was the, the classic argument was that prices of labor would fall i.e wages would fall to a level at which there would be jobs people be worth employing people again and jobs would come back but of course this didn't happen there seemed to be a lot of permanent unemployment and what his idea is? Well, he's uh, he, he was actually quite radical. He actually looked at the idea of the public listed companies that Chandler has argued were the, the, the driving force of capitalism. And actually, and the M form was great, and the private regulation great was that. But he actually said that this was actually a new form of capitalism. And in some ways, he actually argued that capitalism was dead. Capitalism to him died. When people stopped running their own business, as Adam Smith believed they would do, they had to be self-employed, etc. And actually people started to own shares in the company. And this was because people have talked about shares of investment, but he argued that share owners are not investors. Shareholders are speculators. What they actually because unless you actually put the money where the company's first set up, when the money goes to the company, it's often used to develop an idea, which is sort of like Dragon's Den, seed funding, uh, that sort of thing. Maybe even with IPOs, internet, initial public offerings, etc., that might be true. But mostly what actually happens is that you set up a system in which you are secondary market, you're buying shares. The money doesn't go to the company, the money goes to the pocket of the person who owns the shares. So you're speculating. The first people might be investors, but future people who call themselves investors are not investors at all, but speculators. And this, of course, then becomes a problem. At the time, speculator... Uh, was something of considered to be something of an abusive term, same as a liberal is an abusive term. So when he's telling people to speculate, he's, he's abusing them. He's saying, look, you are not people who contribute to the economy at all. You are parasites on the economy. Uh, and But he also believed that these people, as in this old saying, you cannot con an honest man, these people themselves were ripe for being ripped off. And so what he believed was that actually they required a new regulation, new corporate government capitalism, a new corporate governance in which both shareholders and society at large would be protected. So he was arguing for this, should bring into existence the new modern idea of corporate governance. 
Uh, and from this sort of idea, we come on to the things that we'll look at later on, so the CAB report, corporate governance reports, etc. He also argued that the political system had been set up to benefit speculators, to benefit companies. This is something that you will hear a lot about the crash of 2008. So there's nothing new about it. We're talking about back in 1929. The political system was owned by big business. Big business had gained control of it. And of course, this is one of the things that led Fred FDR to try and break up the big things, to the antitrust laws, etc. Because Bill was actually saying that, he, again, this argument that he was not actually anti-capitalist. All these are liberal and often being just abuses, socialist, etc. He was not talking about killing capitalism. In fact, he believed he was the one who could save capitalism from itself. So what conclusions did that? Well, he said, if we want long term, we need stability. If we want long term returns, we require stability. OK, and as long as we argue for short term, the primacy of short term reports, the third time the primacy of short term uh, investment, we will have problems. And the free market is naturally short term. This is because of. If people are waiting over time for returns, somebody may come in and offer to buy out those returns in the hope of taking something short term. So the free market tends towards short home. Stockholders themselves are not saving and investing, not holding stock for a long time, not taking interest in running the companies. Remember what I said about the crash when Northern Rock went down and the people who owned Northern Rock shares were saying on television, who was looking after us, who was monitoring the management? And people say, well, actually, you were. You were supposed to monitor them. We said, actually, well, stockholders didn't do that. Stockholders look for a quick book, bought a share, see the share price boost and sell it and speculate it on. And this broke the connection between the buying of stocks. Shareholders no longer were interested in buying and running companies. So this gave a lot of independence. Now, Chandler argued this was a good thing, because Chandler believed these were all the good lads, all from the same university, good background, on this decent, like, semi-aristocratic stock, and that they, that they would do the right thing. But actually, he was saying that actually the, this was not true. These people were actually there in it for themselves, and at the time... That's going to get worse. And the idea was stockholders were becoming supine, passive, but they were protected. So effectively, what was happening here was that we say that stockholders were protected from their errors. Look at the difference with the banks in 2008, when the stockholders were pretty much wiped out and the bankers were protected. Do it. And he actually started to say that uh, this idea of shareholding and stockholding in America is now, and this was back in the 20s, back in the 30s, it's the idea that you're an entrepreneur if you own stocks and shares. It still exists to a great extent in America. So when I first went over there, there was an amazing number of people who owned a tiny number of shares and believed that it gave them sort of personal attachment to capitalism, that they were some sort of entrepreneur. But I say they're not a based in fact. You're a speculator. You're buying on the secondary market. So it's, it, it isn't real in any sense. So this, of course, addresses the key question of the course. I already said right at the beginning, the point of this course is to decide who owns a business. And so we say that, we're saying, actually, who's responsible for it? Who actually has to run it? Who owns it? And we break it down to the fact there are people who own the shares. Are they their business owners? <coughs> are the people who control the business? And to a certain extent, then we start talking about, so we come across the object of something called surplus. This is the money, the wealth that is generated, and the value produced by a business. And it is not just profit. There are many ways in which a business can contribute. It can pay interest, it can pay large wages, etc. It can pay substantial bonuses. So these all come out of the thing. So we should get away from the idea of profit in economic terms being the same as profit in accountancy terms. So in a way, we're breaking from those used to accountancy and all in the past to understand exactly what are the benefits of running your business. You have to generate this value, and we're arguing over who gets to share the surplus. Where does it go? Does the state get some of it? Does the people get some of it? The employers get some of it? Does some of it re reflect in lower wages, etc.? So that is the key arguments. But it's not only saying how, who should get it. We also have to understand how do we make sure the money goes to the right person. If we come up with a system, we come up with a belief saying X should get 10% and Y should get 30%, how do we make sure that actually happens? So a little bit of optional reading just to finish it off, to do that. 